If you've been in the architectural acoustics field long enough, you'll run across the story of how in 1912, our profession was influenced by an ill-fated anti-gravity machine. Professor Sabayan's quick debunking of that machine helped secure funding to build Riverbank Acoustic Labs. Inside the Geneva History Museum, next to an old theater popcorn machine and closed up behind a false wall, is hidden one of the last surviving components of Colonel Fabian's acoustic anti-gravity device. In 2019, the museum's curator gave a small group of us the unique opportunity to examine the device's existing components and supporting files. No one in the group was interested in the device's flying capabilities, but everyone was curious what the device must have sounded like during Sabine's testing. This study uses newspaper accounts, photographic measurements, computer modeling, and simulation to answer that question. We start with a short history. You will recall an original copy of Shakespeare's first folio recently sold at auction for $10 million. This collection of Shakespeare's works was published in 1623. During the 1700s, the first folio was used as evidence that Shakespeare was the greatest playwright that had ever lived. But during the 1800s, some began to question whether Shakespeare's education was adequate for him to be the true author. For example, in 1856, Delia Bacon published a magazine article comparing Shakespeare's writing style to that of Sir Francis Bacon. Interest grew, and by 1884, more than 255 books, pamphlets, and articles had been written on the subject. In 1888, U.S. politician and science fiction author Ignatius Donnelly published The Great Cryptogram. In that book, Donnelly found Bacon's full biography by making mathematical hops, skips, and jumps through the Shakespeare text. Donnelly's book inspired others to look for hidden texts. Dr. Orville Owen's 1893 book claimed to find a cipher within Shakespeare's plays where Bacon even admits killing Shakespeare. Shortly after his book was published, Dr. Owen hired Elizabeth Gallup and her sister Katie Wells as stenographers. By 1899, Elizabeth Gallup had published her own book claiming to have found Sir Francis Bacon's biliteral cipher coded into the various typesets in the first folio. To confuse things further, Bacon actually did invent a, bi a biliteral cipher. The so-called Baconian theory gained popularity with the upper classes and several Bacon Society clubs were formed to promote the idea. In Chicago, millionaire George Fabian became intrigued with the idea and sent for expert Dr. Owen. According to Owen, Francis Bacon had beheaded William Shakespeare in a fit of rage. He had buried the head in a vault located at the bottom of the River Wye near Shepstow, Wales. Finding the head would prove Owen's cipher was accurate and would also prove Bacon's authorship. So in 1910, Fabian financed Owen to find the vault under the River Wye. But after a year and a half of digging in the mud with no results, Fabian was ready to end the expedition. Owen suddenly sent word that he had found stone inscriptions from Bacon detailing the design of an airship that used sound to produce lift. Fabian decided to let the expedition continue while he hired Elizabeth Gallup and her sister 
to search for the description of the airship hidden within the first folio. By the end of 1912, Gallup announced that she had found a description of the anti-gravity device. Fabian next hired Chief Engineer Bert Eisenhower to construct the device. According to Gallup, the device consisted of a spinning drum inside a shell. String harps on the spinning drum played a harmonic chord. Matching harps on the inside of the shell responded in sympathetic vibration. The resulting sound canceled the force of gravity. Eisenhower built the machine, but it would not fly. The device seemed to go out of tune at high speeds. They concluded centrifugal force was warping the piano strings. To fix the problem, Fabian sent for Harvard professor and acoustic expert Wallace Sabine to inspect the machine and determine how to keep the strings in tune while spinning. The professor quickly exposed the device as a hoax, and Fabian just as quickly sent his finance officer to Wales to stop Dr. Owen's digging operation. While in Fabian's service, Professor Sabine related his needs for a specialized acoustic testing facility. In 1915, Fabian offered to build Sabine's acoustic lab on his Riverbank estate. Sabine delivered those blueprints in 1916, and the lab was complete in 1918. Riverbank Acoustic Labs donated the, donated the machine to the Geneva History Museum. The device is not currently on display. Uh, the cylinder is hidden behind a false wall in the museum. It's viewable only from the top of a step ladder or a selfie stick tall enough to look over the wall. The shell halves are in storage. Each shell half has the appearance of a curved piano soundboard. Many of the parts appear to have been taken directly from an upright piano. Each shell half contains three harps for a total of six. Each harp is composed of seven string series. Three of the harps have bass strings and the other three have treble strings. The cylinder has a similar alternating arrangement of harps. Although the uh, device has been sitting for a hundred years and the soundboards are split in various places, we all wondered out loud what it sounded like. Unfortunately, there was little tension or tone left on the strings. The construction of the shell and cylinder suggests the cylinder shaft was held vertically and the cylinder was spun inside the outer shell. This position puts the heavy tuning heads close to the floor. It also allows a power takeoff belt to drive the cylinder by a belt drum on top of the assembly. No mechanism was found for striking the piano strings. One stationary hammer inside the outer shell could be positioned to strike the strings on the rotating drum. Sympathetic vibration of the shell would then tend to cause those strings to vibrate. The best clue to the tuning of the strings was the obvious use of upright piano parts. Comparing type, length, and the number of strings for each note to that of a piano, only one string arrangement was an obvious match. Both the bass and treble harps are set to produce an A major 13th chord. Supporting evidence of a harmonic chord is discovered in newspaper accounts of Dr. Owen prior to his meeting with Colonel Fabian. The previous decade had been one of invention. The Wright brothers were trying to win the race to market their airplane. Their unique engine had a firing rate of about 37 hertz. 
Louis Brennan was trying to market his gyro-stabilized monorail. His gyros hummed at 50 hertz. Owen heard these two machines and concluded their lifting powers were due to sound. He experimented with bees, observing they didn't fly until they could generate a 230 hertz buzz. Owen's idea was to place a spinning wooden top inside a close-fitting cast bell. The spinning top would act like Brendan's gyrostat, gyrostat. The bell would ring in sympathetic vibration, and sounding the right tone would cancel gravity. In 1907, Owen applied for a patent on vibratory flight and claimed to have lifted 22 tons of steel with one of his devices. Two years later, Owen and a partner organized the Standard Aviation Company. The company raised $20,000 to build a vibratory airship. Finite element analysis was used to determine the loads and stresses on the cylinder. These were seen to be realistic and within limits. To simulate the tone response of the device, FEA was used to determine the modal response of the bass and treble sounding boards. FEA also determined the open cavity response of the shell. This is a simulation of the device spinning up. For low speeds, it's relatively harmonic, but as the speed increases, hammer impact noise dominates. The detuning, which Eisenhower attributed to centrifugal force, may just have been a, the dominance of rapid hammer strike noise. And although the simulation fits with the evidence, uh, the result, resulting sound is a bit disappointing. So just for the heck of it, what if Dr. Owen had been right and had successfully built and flown his airship. Newspapers give some descriptions of Dr. Owen's concept. The airship is 60 feet wide and 80 feet long and looks like a double-decker streetcar without the running gear. Seven large vibrating bells on the airship's roof create lift while the propellers provide motive force. Running this through NASA's NAL programs used to predict aircraft noise Here's the sound of Dr. Owen's vibratory airship flying overhead. This is the likely description of the sound of Fabian's device. But more important is how the idea of the device helped boost the fields of acoustics and code breaking. Gallup stayed on to develop Riverbank's Department of Ciphers. This group trained hundreds of very talented code breakers. During the First World War, this department decoded a majority of all intercepted messages. And although he didn't live to see it, Professor Sabine's Test Chamber Zero continues to serve the scientific study of new acoustic concepts. Thank you.